Kutam Milunudi Zuabid, Kararna. Welcome to the dimension of destiny, and more precisely, the continent of muscle. To the east lie the twisted nests of the basin elves, tall as trees and silent as jaguars. To the west dwell the fey watchers of Pale Swamp, fetid wielders of watery magics that stray all too close to the forest of sloth. But at the fifth cardinal, perched atop the jungle of basins, pinched betwixt the tall mountains of the blotted crest and the ice-topped peaks of the full barbs, we find relic shimmered, mountain home to the fresh-spawn dwarves of the Raz's Kill. High walls and proud towers astride the mighty Atir A Lushon, a shining jewel of the dwarven nation. Were you to travel but two short days north, through the Auburn jungle and over the Hill of Wait, you would find yourself at the Silken Waters. And on the shore of this calm body stand seven noble souls with a vision. A vision of greatness, of enterprise, and quite possibly of not a small amount of dwarven hanky-panky. <gasps> now then, continuing the introductions, I am Flem Crevice, divine creator and scholar. And the lakeside hive, a buzz with activity below, is Labor Lord. Not much to look at yet, but just you wait. And what's this? Ah, more beautiful charcoal work by Fath, our resident lumberjill. She's really captured the majesty of the silken waters. Bearing the resemblance of a dwarf of 82 years, she's as creative as a brace of bunnies, but her grasp on reality wouldn't strangle a pigeon. Off she goes, away with the fairies, cute as a button. And here's Solon. A terribly awkward individual, but she does so love books and numbers. Oh, she's off! She's a very particular dwarf, which helps with the bookkeeping. And she's moved that bull an inch to the left. Much better there, Solon. I have to agree. Oh, not quite done. That rabbit causing problems. Yes, that seems to have done the trick. Oh, look! It would appear that Locum has begun a little burrow with the assistance of Nil and Degel. And if I'm not mistaken, they've used the digestive system of a goat as a guide. How wonderful. Well, perhaps now would be a good time to talk of the intentions of our industrious little friends. Our expedition leader Nish, the huge heavily muscled warrior over there picking flowers, remembers being born to wealthy parents in the upper echelons of dwarven society. He can recall playing in Relic Shimmer's loftiest towers, knocking elbows and quite often heads with the dwarflings that would become the leaders of the many guilds and temples that serve none but the elite. He laments the many years wasted toiling, scrabbling to the top of the dog pile in a rat race of a doggy doggy rat world. Burnt out and used up, his lifetime of backstabbing and betrayal leaving a burnished scar upon his very soul. I say remember and recall, because of course he didn't exist until five minutes ago, but he doesn't know that, and his fabricated past is causing some entertainingly genuine grief. So yes, a lifetime of struggle and woe. Nish caught wind of an expedition to the calm tranquility of the Silken Waters, relieved the then leader of his head and position, and set off for a cleaner, simpler future. There was some talk of the rich deposits of metals, a desperate need for weapons and armour, the impending downfall of the dwarven capital to bloodthirsty elves, but Nish is here for flowers. As for the others, for now, let us just say that they are happy to be away from their own fictional pasts, and leave it at that. Well now, would you look at this? 
Locom Neil and Decker have done a wonderful job clearing out all that dirt and soil. They've even gone so far as to erect some wooden block rooms to keep the worms at bay. Not the most spacious of spaces, but I have it on good authority that their efforts are directed elsewhere. Let's give them a little time and see how it pans out. Ah yes, nice and homely, or at least preferable to sleeping in the rain. Wait a minute, oh no, I was thinking this might happen. Note the ratio of dwarf to furniture, particularly beds. Yes, that will be locums doing a no mistake. A self-proclaimed love machine, locum has all the sex appeal of a sock full of custard. A greasy, lustful oversharer with a single-minded drive to lie to himself and the world, with only the former bearing half a chance at success. I can only imagine how he believes this ruse should succeed. As a matter of fact, it would appear Fath has thought ahead. Very atypical for her, but I agree with the necessity. Moving on, a need for stone has led the dwarves down. Here you can see their little budding strip mine. We'll check back once they've made more of a dent. Now here is where the effort is truly focused. A trade depot within its very own room attached to what the dwarves plan to be a tavern for visitors. I doubt the building will be complete before the dwarven wagons arrive to trade, but the depot itself should suffice for this year. Solon has made some noise regarding keeping her office up here, which shouldn't be too difficult to do. I think the fact that we're storing all items in a big pile on the floor is causing her some issues. Once the infrastructure is settled, I'm sure everything will be packed away neat and tidy. I don't think she's convinced. Now take a look at this. Ark. These mere specks of sentience drift aimlessly upon yon pale blue dot in a vast and indifferent cosmos. Their existence, a fleeting blip amidst cosmic chaos, fighting to be lost in the annals of time. A game of hide and seek bereft of seekers, wherein they scurry, seeking fervently for purpose, while this world reveals in their futile tools. An embrace, soothing yet chilly, of eternal nothingness lies afore, wherein their struggles and aspirations dissolve into the abyss, lost to oblivion's silent call. Ha <laughs> ha! Hilarious, no? Perhaps I should explain. This morose Moggy is a little more than she may appear. Whilst fiddling with the fundamentals of world generation, I came upon a particularly uppity little sea demon, and it amused me to obliterate its form and mould its essence into this cat. Nicely little chance of it exploding as it threatened. Indeed, the only vestiges of its previous existence are its unfeline love of water and its propensity to ponder in poems. The dwarves have decided to name it Puddlekins, which just fills me with delight. Oh ho! The supply caravans have arrived. With barely minutes to spare since the trade depot was erected. Good job there, dwarves. No, oh, but what's this? It appears we've been graced by the presence of the Queen Consort. Acting as a liaison to the mountain home? What on... Bear with me. Hmm. Bedroom. Uh, DIY mishap. 
a few days away to fix. So it would appear our King Law was practicing his crossbow throwing for the summer celebration of Silva in their bedchambers. He got drunk, or well, more drunk, and decided that the issue with his aim was not down to the mushroom wine, but instead the fact that the bows were not loaded. Suggesting a delightfully poetic intent on the part of an inanimate object that nevertheless resulted in the loss of two gem windows, the gain of multiple unmentionable stains, and the king's sudden need for a tan brown hamster to prevent a tantrum spiral. DIY mishap indeed. Well, be welcome whatever the reason for your visit, your highness. No, oh dear, she's gone to talk to Nish. This is exactly the sort of scenario he was picking flowers to get away from. Hold it together, old horse, it's just a bit of fort admin. Squeeze your emotional support, Daffodil. That's a dwarf. So, let's see what's what. Ah, trade requests. Lovely. We'll get some silk, some cloth, some seeds, and a little yarn. At exorbitant prices, how wonderful. In return, they would like us to focus on tanned hides and footwear. I'm not really planning on a booming clothing empire, but we can maybe work something out. Nanuza Sean, farewell, your highness. With that done, I suppose it's time to drag Nish out of his monarch-induced fetal position and get to some haggling. I was a little concerned regarding the distinct lack of trade goods, apparently a concern shared by Solon, as she asked the others for ideas. Degel saved the day, drawing attention to the collection of pretty rocks that Nil had been gathering, shaping, smoothing, and polishing in her spare time. Not the most valuable of baubles, but with the handful of professionally cut white chalcedonies, Degel added, and a little wine, we've got some coin to play with. And it would appear we will be using that coin to mostly invest in a better caravan next year. What a disappointment. The most exciting additions were a tomcat in a zinc cage and some cow cheese. So named for the picture of a cow on the packaging. Lord only knows what creature could produce such greasy lumps. The cow is laughing, as well it might. Farewell, traders. May your fare be more so upon the next visit. I've given the dwarves a little bit of time to make some progress, and they haven't disappointed. Neil discovered the beginnings of a tetrahedrite vein, which was upstaged almost immediately by Locum, discovering a vast cavern underground. Neil and Degel had to carry him out, and poor dwarf was white as milk. It transpires that he was digging almost directly down when his pick burst through the ceiling of the hollow, and the floor gave way. Degel found him dangling by his boots, his scream hoarsened voice reduced to a meep. Taking a look at the cavern, I can see some real potential. Lots of lovely flora to collect, steady niche, and the space to really spread out and get comfortable. And I can even detect the subtle susurration of subterranean springs. But further delving will have to wait, because there's the distinct buzz of new life in the air. Indeed, winter has ended, and with it passes our first year with the dwarves of Labelyord. Noting a few things that happened off-screen, as it were, Fath continues to be a delight. She's been scribbling away, as we've not had much need for wood, and created this absolute masterpiece of mind fudgery. Supposedly it's Nish. Though, seeing as he's neither bald nor that flexible, I think we'll have to take a word for it. 
Speaking of niche, he and Solon are together. Although how they consider themselves lovers when they share a room with Locum, I'll never know. Perhaps they've taken to utilising Solon's office, which is all finished now with a very solid lock. All told, we're doing rather well. So for now, with the warmth of a new year upon us, we say a short-lived goodbye to the calm serenity of the silken waters. We shall return, have no worries. Anu Zeshon, farewell, my friends. Why's Fath cut all that wood? Okay, what I'm going to need you to do now, Pai Pai, I need you to say, and remember, like and subscribe. And remember, like and subscribe. That's beautiful, thank you. Mwah. <laughs>